massive economic plan across countries and continents with the One Belt, One Road initiative. Involving more than 65 countries, China is creating a new world order through trade and commerce. And the Middle East and North Africa are crucial markets for Chinese enterprises to establish their economic hegemony. Considered to be a cradle of ancient civilization, Egypt is our final destination for this year's Silk Road. Mired in history, Cairo has been the capital for the last 1,000 years, welcoming traders and tourists alike with its entrepreneurial flair and hospitality. And the Chinese are taking up the invitation, descending on the capital with their traditional trade and commerce. It's aiming to use Egypt as an economic nerve center, a vital cog that sits in the middle of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Egypt is the second country on China's new maritime silk route and the One Belt, One Road initiative after Pakistan. The plan is to increase China's maritime traffic to the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal by developing several port cities for manufacturing and trade. Due to increased trade, President Sisi is trying to make Egypt a critical trading partner with Beijing in the Middle East and the remaining countries on the One Belt, One Road. A country of over 95 million, Egypt is the most populous country in North Africa and is being dubbed as China's gateway to Africa. Fayez Farahad, an expert in economics and geopolitics, is excited to see a new superpower rising in the region. What role will Egypt play in China's One Belt, One Road as it relates to mm. China's access to Africa, mm. African markets? Yes, because of the geographical location of Asia, China can consider Egypt as the gate for Africa, not only the gate for Africa, but the gate for the Arab world, the Arab region, Europe also, because uh, Egypt uh, is near to the south of Europe. According to the map of uh, One Belt, One Road, I think um, Egypt is uh, located uh, a part of the maritime axis of this mm -hmm. initiative. Egypt's political turbulence has traditionally been a major handicap for its economic development. The country has faced several political upheavals from within leading to mass instability and a stagnant economy. The most prominent uprising came at Tahrir Square in 2011 that led to the ousting of President Hosni Mubarak, who had ruled the country for 43 years. But the newly elected president, Mohamed Morsi, of the Muslim Brotherhood, didn't last long. The Egyptian army mounted a coup and the court sent Morsi behind bars for 25 years. That brought Egyptian military chief Abdul Fattah el-Sisi to power, who today is the most powerful person in the country and the president of Egypt since 2014. China is banking on him for economic and political stability in the region. The military intervention in the region in the 90s and also in 2003 in Iraq and Libya. The experience of the military intervention of the Western powers in general in the Middle East, they didn't lead to stability in the Middle East. If China is aiming to build a multipolar system to the Middle East is important because the shift have been made here. This is why the Middle East is important for China. It will make the shift from the unipolar system to the multipolar system. President Sisi met Chinese Premier Xi Jinping in 2016, signing deals worth 17 billion US dollars for Egypt in special economic zones and joint productions with China. The relationship between the two is steeped in history with Chinese traders for centuries bringing goods through Egypt and the Middle East before traveling onwards to Europe. Stopovers like the Khan al Khalili Bazaar were critical for layovers and conducting business. It's one of the world's oldest covered markets, having been founded in 1382 due to the spice route trade between Europe and China. Named after the great Khans who conquered Egypt in the 14th century, the bazaar became a major center for foreign trade. 
So how old is the Khan El Khalili Bazaar? Ah, mid seven, mid seven. And it's a very old bazaar. I mean, bazaar or some other. I mean, the Malakia and then the Malakia Jumhuria had its bazaar with each other. In your opinion, uh, how is the Egyptian economy doing? لا لا الاقتصاد بالنسبه للعهد السيسي في تحسن كتير قوي طبعا ودي بس عمليه مساله وقت وهتلاقي ازدهار اقتصادي جامد يعني يعني يبقى في ازدهار وهتبقى مصر دي من الدول اللي هي تقدر تقول عليها يعني مش الدول العظمى انما على الاقل نبقى حتى ماشيين جنبهم يعني دول كويسه يعني اقتصادها لان مصر عندها مقومات كتيره جدا اقتصاديا وبشريا واعتقد ده ممكن يقوم هذا البلد بسرعه يعني اكثر مما تتوقع يعني Ahmad decided to help us get a closer feel of the bazaar by dressing me up as one of the great con traders of the 14th century. All right, thanks guys, thanks guys. All right, well, as the saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So having a little lighthearted fun, getting dressed up as a con, maybe what they would have worn when they walked through this great bazaar hundreds of years ago. Ornate gates and upper stories whose external facades lined with Arabic scriptures where merchants' rooms were located are preserved in time. Today, it is one frantic, dizzying retail extravaganza where you can buy pretty much anything from jeans and gold to hookahs and magic oils. Traditional workshops continue to operate in the surrounding area. As night falls, the area is swarmed with tourists out to buy trinkets, carpets, and extravagant perfumes. Wael Kadur has been walking through these intricate bazaars for years. He understands that Egypt has the potential to be a global economic player for China in the region. Can you give a historical perspective of the ancient Silk Route and how it passed through Egypt? The, the Silk Road is a very ancient road for trade between China and Europe, uh, more than 3,000 years before Christ. Now, there is another new Silk Road, which we call Belt and Road. Within two years, it may be reached 600 billion US dollars. The trade between China and Africa reaches 400 billion US dollars. Bilateral relations between Egypt and China have entered its 60th year and trade between the two has now swelled into the billions. We visit the most important Chinese man in Cairo today to understand the extent of China's footprint in Egypt. Han Bing is the commercial and economic attaché at the Chinese embassy here in Cairo. He is coordinating this massive Egyptian makeover with the decision makers in Beijing as Chinese investments are springing up across the landscape. Can you outline some of the major Chinese investments or companies that are here in Egypt? When we collect uh, the information from the companies uh, operating here from China with Chinese investment, uh, we come to the figure near 7 billion. It's general authority for the investment as free zone of Egypt. They have about 1,300 companies registered in the in the cafe. But first, we need to build the infrastructure, like the, the Teta Zone in Ain Sukhna for the expansion area. Also, they are now constructing the infrastructure and expecting to attract, I think, about 10 billion US dollars. We have many challenges here. First, we need to know each other better. One Belt, One Road initiative, we should say, is the idea. It's the idea presented to the world. In this concept, we are focusing on the five areas. 
So first one is the policy exchange. The second one is infrastructure connectivity. And third is for the trade and investment facilitation. Uh, fourth is uh, financial cooperation. And the last one is the exchange between the people. So we are focusing on these five areas. Agreements with Egypt in the fields of manufacturing and the development of ports and energy sources have been inked and are fast becoming a reality. But the thousand-year-old city of Cairo, where all these agreements were signed, is struggling. With one of the fastest growing populations in the region, the old city of Cairo has turned into a congested mess. It takes hours to go from one point to another, making it highly unattractive for foreign businesses to set up base here in the capital. It's congested and chaotic. With more than 10 million inhabitants, Cairo's infrastructure is not able to meet the needs of its people. So they're moving it right here. The new capital, planned to be the size of Singapore, is due to have an airport larger than London's Heathrow, a building taller than Paris's Eiffel Tower, and 10,000 kilometers of roads and avenues. China Fortune Land Development signed agreements with Egyptian authorities to develop parts of the new capital. It has signed a deal to develop and manage 5,700 hectares of Egypt's new administrative capital at a cost of 20 billion US dollars. And just a road trip from old Cairo towards the new capital shows hundreds of billboards advertising the luxurious new lifestyle that awaits the people of Egypt. The city is planned to consist of 21 residential districts, from houses ranging from 400,000 to 1 million US dollars, it's President Sisi's promise of a more luxurious lifestyle for those who can afford it. It is projected to have a population of 5 million people in the next five years and solve the chronic housing problems of old Cairo. Ahmad Sabur is one of the largest developers in Cairo overseeing this massive initiative. What role is China playing in Egypt's housing market? Lots. To start with, uh, China State, which is one of the, it's the biggest, largest company in the world, as far as I understand, or uh, as far as I'm sure they are, and it's a government-owned uh, company. They just signed the contract to develop the central business district in the new capital. It's a $3 billion project, and it was signed on the day of the launch, I said that was a month and a half ago where, where we attended this launch. $3 billion project, which is all the office buildings, all the, the business district of the capital. So this is not a housing project. It is planned that the new capital will transfer the parliament, presidential palaces, government ministries, and foreign embassies all to this place. It's estimated to be completed between 2020 and 2022 and may end up costing nearly 45 billion US dollars, according to some estimates. This massive project, however, hasn't come without its fair share of problems. Complications arose when Chinese contractors backed out due to overpriced construction rates. Critics further argued the reason for a new capital, uprooting thousands of government employees to be taken to a barren desert area but the creation of jobs in the construction sector inside Egypt finally led to a compromise between the two countries. With the Chinese companies that are investing in New Cairo, are they bringing in Chinese laborers or are they using local Egyptians? Both. It needs to be a win-win. Mm -hmm. Chinese companies, great companies, are coming here to invest in a very high potential country. And we are very happy that they make money and make profits and make more money and make more profits. But we have an unemployment problem. Sure. So it needs to be a win-win. This win-win situation has attracted powerful Egyptian construction giants like Mountain View. They're developing projects like the Hyde Park, the largest landscape park in New Cairo. The company is headed by Ayman Ismail, a private contractor who swiftly invested in President Sisi's dream of a new capital at a time when some Chinese financiers backed out. Ayman, who later went on to head the advisory board 
on the new administrative capital as its chairman, is excited about the new city situated 40 kilometers outside of old Cairo. Why is there a new need for a new capital in Egypt? It's not going to be a replacement to the new capital. It's going to be an extension to the current capital, and that's very legitimate. Cairo won last year, and I say won in a, in a kind of a, you know, sarcastic way to a certain degree, the fastest growing city in the world, you know, uh, in terms of population. We've just added half a million people in Cairo last year. But there's more to the Egyptian Chinese story than just the new capital, with the launch of the new Suez Canal. Being dubbed as the Egyptian dream, will this canal be able to withstand the massive security and infrastructure challenges the Chinese proposal poses. Chinese investments in Egypt have poured into the country in the billions, with more than 50 Chinese private and publicly listed companies now operating in the country. The One Belt One Road initiative has arrived in Egypt, but the jewel of the Egyptian crown is the development of the new and advanced Suez Canal, an economic zone spanning 460 square kilometers. For more than 150 years, the Suez Canal has been the lifeblood of the Egyptian economy that has undergone political and military crisis. Opened in 1869, it was completed and largely owned by a British and French company. Egypt got back the ownership only in 1956 after former Egyptian president Jamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal and took back control. It led to the Suez Canal crisis and the region was thrown into turmoil. To win the Suez Canal back militarily, the United Kingdom, France, and Israel attacked and invaded Egypt. The Egyptian military struck back with full force. A ceasefire was finally announced in 1957 after intense pressure from the United States and the United Nations. Over the next 50 years, the Suez Canal's transformation has been breathtaking as foreign invaders were replaced with foreign investors. In August 2014, President Sisi announced the expansion of the Suez Canal project with much fanfare to promote the economic lifeline of the country. A new 72-kilometer canal was dug parallel to the existing canal in two years for two-way maritime and cargo traffic. By 2016, the two-way Suez Canal was ready to serve as a major maritime trade route. Entirely funded by the Egyptian people, over 64 billion Egyptian pounds were raised through investment certificates to fund its expansion. Today, it's been dubbed as the Egyptian dream. Promotional campaigns under President Sisi are selling their biggest development project to the Chinese to develop special economic zones around the canal. Suez Canal Economic Zone is the promising area. In November 2015, and on this land, a hopeful voice came out. Today, and after only two years, the promise has been fulfilled. The Suez Canal Zone seeks to benefit from its close proximity to major maritime and economic markets in the region with abundant land and human resources available. It aims to provide investors with a market of 1.6 billion customers in the Middle East and North Africa under preferential trade agreements. Egypt is developing industrial zones along the canal to boost the SC zone as a world-class logistics and trade center. More than one million jobs are expected to be created over the next 15 years with shipbuilding and repair made easy for international traders. And I'm at the Suez Canal, one of the most important geostrategic maritime trading routes and China is arriving in its customary style. 11% of Chinese maritime trade passes through the Suez Canal to cater for the North African markets. Beijing's trade with North Africa aims to increase the waterway capacity of the Suez Canal 
to reach 97 ships a day. That will potentially double Egypt's canal revenues from 6 billion US dollars to nearly 13 billion US dollars annually. And the role of this man is vital for the Chinese who aim to utilize the expanded Suez Canal for two-way maritime traffic. Mohab Mamish heads the Suez Canal Authority and reports directly to President Sisi himself. And we've got an exclusive interview to find out more about Egypt's dream project. Why was the new Suez Canal an important project for President Sisi? It was not for President Sisi, it was for Egypt. Okay. Okay. We made this Suez Canal not for per one person, but for all the Egyptian people. Because we have some troubles in the system of the Suez Canal. If you have any defect in any ship, you have to stop all the Suez Canal. Mm. Because we are working in one leg only. Mm. But now we have two tracks. If something wrong in the track, in one track, you can change the uh, navigation to the other track. And we are limited with the new ships in the depths, in the drafts of the ships. And now we have many mega ships in the fleets in the world. We have to be ready to trade with the new standard of the ships. We have to make the canal deeper, wider, mm -hmm. and faster. Singapore Ports Authority is also working in the East Port Said. Can you tell us a little bit more about that as well? Singapore, they are very high experience. We have a very good connection with them. Mm -hmm. I start working with them and I uh, convince our president Sisi to come to visit Singapore and I visit Singapore with him because I have a uh, very good uh, relation with them. They are uh, very decent and they are uh, very uh, straight mm -hmm. and they are uh, very uh, faithful. With the rise in China's trade to Africa to more than 80 billion US dollars annually, the Suez Canal is aiming to become an international trading hub, not only for transit purposes. To serve as a manufacturing base for Chinese companies trading with Africa, special economic zones, or SEZs, are being developed under the One Belt, One Road plan around the canal. What is the strategic importance of the Suez Canal Economic Zone? We would like to show our experience how to develop the economic zones. How will Chinese companies benefit from having the Made in Egypt stamp on their products? Of course, they will have uh, the better access, access to, the, to the market around the Egypt when uh, the Egypt has these trade agreements with these uh, countries. And uh, also, I think here we can uh, have the lower cost of the production. And uh, also investment in the production can help Egypt to industrialization the country to get stronger in the economy that we can develop economical cooperation. More Chinese companies are being promoted to set up shop in Egypt due to cheaper costs of production and its close proximity to a large consumer market in North Africa. Egypt have the best skilled labor. The position of Egypt, we can export to, let's say, to Europe without any customs. The same thing for the Arab, uh, Arab world, we can export the same thing for the Comesa, and we can export to Africa without customs. One of the most important port cities inside the Suez Canal economic zone is Ain Sokna, a port that connects the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. As part of the One Belt, One Road initiative, one of the leading Chinese companies is ensuring that more investments flow here. The Tita Group, one of the oldest industrial developers in China, have created this seven square kilometer industrial zone, which now has 68 Chinese companies. Due to Tita's economic zone, Chinese fiberglass manufacturing giants have flown in to Ayn Sokna port in style. 
Jushi Egypt arrived here two years ago and today has a total investment of 223 million US dollars, making it the biggest private Chinese investment in Egypt. Jushi has had an immediate impact on the local economy. It has hired more than 1,900 Egyptian workers to boost the local employment in the region and has only a limited number of 50 Chinese staff members. By setting up a manufacturing base in the Suez Canal economic zone, Jushi is now exporting 95% of its goods from Ain Sokna to Europe and North Africa. As a result, freight costs for Jushi have greatly reduced in comparison to its earlier shipments that arrived via sea routes from their headquarters in the Chinese city of Jiexiang. Jushi's move to Egypt has made it more competitive and efficient. What role does Tita play in uh, Jushi's operations here? This area belongs to Tita uh, investment. So when we come here, the Tita support us to make, uh, make this factory. And uh, they support us to finish our lessons and support us uh, our gas power, all the things. Uh, after this, we can uh, run it smooth. The labor from Egypt is cheaper than China. It's first it's the most important thing. But not the first, the first for the miner, you know. Egyptians have many, many different miners to manufacture the fiberglass. In order to attract more foreign investment as a manufacturing hub, Egypt is positioning itself as the export gateway to North Africa and Europe. Does having a made in Egypt stamp uh, on Jushi products is that beneficial for the company? Yes, for the fiberglass export from China to, to Europe, it uh, has a very high tax. But from here, we send our production to the Europe, no tax. Big benefit for yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> to relocate here to Egypt. Yes, so it's the most important thing we come here. <laughs> You know, the tax uh, nearly the 36 percent. Jushi has also been able to cut down taxes by taking advantage of the tax breaks being provided by the Egyptian government for foreign investors. With increased profits, Jushi is already setting up a new manufacturing plant in Egypt. Future, not a very long distance, next year. We already purchased another land for new workshop. Next year, we will finish all the workshop such as uh, package manufacture workshop, silica, burn limestone milling workshop, and uh, the natural gas station. Yes, TIDA is uh, very important for us. I can say no TIDA, no, no Jushi. With the rise in Chinese firms, Egyptian firms aren't holding back and are signing joint manufacturing agreements to bring Chinese products to Egypt. After the break, we delve into Egypt's automobile sector and meet the man who is making Chinese cars famous in the country. China's One Belt, One Road initiative is sweeping across the Middle East and North Africa, and Egypt is making its presence felt. Hundreds of contracts worth billions of dollars have been signed with the Chinese in energy, manufacturing, and special economic zones. It's transforming the way Egyptians work, think, and live. And if there is one thing that the Egyptians love, it's their love for imported cars. Traditionally an importer of German and American cars, it is now locally manufacturing joint productions of Chinese cars. They're cheap and easy to make. In less than 10 years, the Egyptian automotive business has grown from just three plants to now manufacturing nearly 100,000 units of passenger cars per year. And plants like this in Cairo are churning out 100 cars a day to satisfy the needs of the Egyptian people. Gabur Autos is responsible for 96% of Chinese cars being sold in Cairo, and its founder, Rauf Gabur, has been nicknamed the Chinese ambassador in Egypt. In 2016 alone, he sold more than 12,000 Chinese brands, Geely and Cherry, 20 years, the Chinese uh, have proven to be able to achieve in much shorter period of time. Uh, and I believe that they are not uh, far away in terms of quality today. Especially when you talk about companies which bought, I'm here uh, stating the example of Geely. Geely bought Volvo a few years back. 
And uh, today we see clearly the impact of the acquisition. Their product quality and uh, styling has improved tremendously. If I would quantify the quality uh, gap, it's, it would be no more than 10%, which I see in the next very few years will be closed. Can you talk about the importance of the China-Egypt collaboration, in particular in the automobile industry? Yeah, I think uh, China was very smart. And I, I have seen the same trend in Korea uh, 25 years ago. Both Korea and China chose testing markets. So they chose some markets where they, are, they were testing their products. Uh, Korea didn't start exporting to the world. They started exporting to some Middle Eastern countries and African countries. And when they tested the product performance in offshore markets, uh, they started then uh, developing, and they, and they developed their management skills to cope with the requirements of export markets. Then they started expanding to uh, other markets. This is exactly what China has done. Rising Egypt-China manufacturing has created a positive mood amongst most Egyptians as lots of hard cash is flowing into the country. As part of the One Belt, One Road deals, Egypt will be receiving millions of dollars in loans to finance massive development projects. It's increased Egypt's foreign reserves in a country that was starved of hard cash after the political turmoil that hit the country in 2011. Ahmed El Sewidi, the head of the Egypt-China Business Council, the body responsible to facilitate Chinese investments in the country, is satisfied with the progress. It was very, quite clear in the last 20 years that the trade with China is being uh, more and more every, every year. And the relation between the Gulf countries and the Egypt it have been also growing in the last 20 years. A lot of China now having a lot of technology and a lot of know-how and now they're not only exporting now goods, they're exporting even technology and factories. So I believe with this road, uh, it will be better for the Chinese to find the better markets. And at the same time for Egyptian and for the Gulf region to find a better partner and more easy partner. Chinese loans and investments in development projects are being welcomed, despite clarity on what the interest rates would be to the public. Despite the risk that Egypt poses for potential investments, Omar El Shaneti, an investment expert, believes that the Chinese know where and how much to invest. Definitely, the Chinese investments are uh, very critical and strategic, and uh, to a very big extent, they are different than the rest of the investments uh, that we are getting for very specific reasons. Number one, um, I would say that China in general is, uh, uh, is more prone to risk. Uh, Chinese institutions uh, have been used to invest across Africa, and we as a firm have worked a lot in different countries in Africa. And whenever you go, you see Chinese companies and contractors and infrastructure companies. So China, uh, as, a, as a nation and Chinese companies are used to high risks. So they view the country here as generally quite a good risk when you compare it to other places they are used to. This is number one. Number two, uh, Chinese uh, do not come to just lend money to the government or to banks, but they really come with projects. As they say in economics, the higher the risk, the higher the return. And Han Bing, the Chinese economic and commercial attaché, believes that Egypt's risks are being viewed as China's opportunities by Beijing. But we are expecting situations uh, stabilizing and the economy is recovering. We, we saw that uh, the last uh, quarter, the Egyptian economy is, uh, has the 4.9% uh, percent growth. Uh, so this gives the the good confidence for the overall economic mm -hmm. situation from the Egyptian uh, business uh, people to Chinese business people, they have the different approach and we, we need to find the, the way that can be accepted by, by both sides. So uh, the culture, the difference is, the, uh, is the, the quite big. The both sides should accommodate or not. Besides all these challenges, we believe uh, that our cooperation will have a very bright future. And uh, I think now the, it's the time uh, for Chinese companies to come to Egypt for the investment. After the break, we visit the Chinese Cultural Center 
to see how cultural barriers are being broken down and meet with an Egyptian Chinese couple who are introducing dragon boating to the Nile. China's One Belt, One Road has arrived in Egypt with billions of dollars of investments and projects. The Chinese dragon has landed in this African nation. From joint productions in manufacturing to facilitating ports to propelling Chinese products to the European markets, they have all been inked. It doesn't end there. There's a cultural exchange also going on between the two countries. The 2,000-year-old Chinese sport of dragon boat racing has found a new waterway on Egypt's Nile River. A dragon boat academy has been inaugurated at the Royal Muhammad Ali Club in Giza and has garnered the interest of Chinese and Egyptian nationals in the area. Mary Lai is solely responsible for this interesting development, but it all began with a sweet Egyptian Chinese love story. I came here to study Arabic. So first of all, I love culture and I love language. And this language become a key to, for me, open many doors. So one of the key, I find my husband. Nice, okay. <laughs> and you've been married for how many years now? No, it's just only uh, five years. Five years, yes. okay. And I think this is one of the beautiful things um, that we're seeing on, you know, the One Belt, One Road or these kind of cross-cultural or uh, intercultural uh, marriages. Mm -hmm. In China, you find it too. You find people from Egypt who have uh, married Chinese women or living there speak perfect Mandarin. Here you are, someone from Hong Kong, have married an Egyptian and you speak fluent Arabic. Yeah, you later will see my husband, Yehab, and he's the coach. He's the first Egyptian. He go to Hong Kong and China to get training as a Dragon Boat coach. What's the idea is, uh, because Egyptian have a civilization and Chinese also civilization. And we bring this civilization together, the Dragon Bowl and the River Nile. Mary's husband, Ihab, has been working hard on spreading dragon boating after he mastered the sport in Hong Kong and Guangzhou. That hand here, your hand, two hand is three. Okay, you're here near the boat. Oh, okay. And then you sit. This leg is up, this leg is back down like that. Okay. And you, your hand to three, so you push. He is currently training several groups of players to prepare for the next festival in Cairo where dragon boat teams from Spain, Cyprus, and others will take part. The trainees, mostly dragon boating for the first time, are excited during the ride as they sit in two rows and learn how to harmoniously row their sticks together. What are the future plans for the Dragon Boating Federation? I think we have a different stages. We are in the beginning stage, so we treat it as a community sport, it's a culture, it's a game, a water game, you know? And then slowly, we probably will be uh, to establish federation, but still too early, because we just want as a community, team building, a culture game. I think um, the culture, we need to learn how to appreciate one another. So one by one row to give this uh, beside the economy, but also in the culture side, to uh, let the Egyptian understand our Chinese culture, what is the story about a dragon boat. Because we last time in May, we do a dragon boat festival, and then we make a, a story to tell them what is the story about Dragon Ball. And it was really amazing because the story of Dragon Ball is a very nationalism, mm -hmm. you know, so, and they really appreciate and they understand. And for, in the future, we want the Egyptian to have the team, the Dragon Ball team, to go to China. Mm -hmm. So they have more exchange, more understand one another. With this foundation, I believe in the future, no matter the economy and all the infrastructure will be helping because for the mutual understanding of one another civilization. To understand the sport better, Ihab invited me to the biggest challenge of them all. My team was being pitted against the mighty Muhammad Ali Club. After some light training, off we went to the Nile's greatest dragon boating competition. So right now we just came out from where we uh, got on the boats. We've had a little bit of practice. Yeah. Uh, what's going to happen next? Are we going to race these guys? Yes, yes. This is the Muhammad Ali Club teams. It's a very strong team in okay. Egypt. And we prepared this team to be to go play outside Egypt. 
we hope so in the future. And uh, we practice this team uh -huh. to make him stronger. And he already he's famous in the River Nile too. So just to let you know, we're going up against an established team. We've, we've dubbed ourselves the Nile Dragons. Yes. And we're yes. going to take on the team. Let's see how we do. Yes, yes, let's we go. Let's right, go, all right? Right, right. Hey. Okay. Heroes, heroes, heroes! Heroes! Oh, yeah. Yeah. On this beautiful day, we've enjoyed a friendly competition on these dragon boats here on the famous Nile River. And though the opposing team clearly won, our coach here said in the end, it was really a situation of win-win. And I think that so typically uh, represents the spirit of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Egypt's Dragon Boat Academy was inaugurated by the Chinese Embassy here in Cairo. Its Chinese cultural center in the heart of Cairo plays a vital role in merging cultural and linguistic barriers between the two nations. This is the first Chinese cultural center in the Middle East, and it has been running for the past 15 years. And I've been invited to learn about one of China's most ancient martial arts forms right here. Tai Chi, short for Tai Chi Chuan, is an internal Chinese martial art practiced for both its defense training and its health benefits. Mark is a Chinese Tai Chi teacher who came to Cairo two years ago and has seen Egyptians taking a keen interest in this art form. How long have you been practicing Tai Chi? Mm, when I was a young boy, I followed my grandpa uh, practicing the Tai Chi. Maybe 10 years old. The people here in Egypt who take your classes, are they enjoying the practice? Yes, I think um, everyone likes this. Why do you practice Tai Chi? Oh, yes, because um, I think the Tai Chi is very, uh, it's Chinese traditional uh, arts, martial arts. I think it's a culture, and it's a tra uh, Chinese style uh, Kung Fu. And I think it's to keep your health good for your healthy. And every day you can practice, I think it's a good spot. First, move your wrist, open. Mark invited me to a class of Tai Chi along with his devoted Egyptian followers. It is believed that focusing the mind solely on the movements of the form helps to bring about a state of mental calm and clarity. Besides general health benefits, stress management attributed to traditional Chinese medicine is taught as well. It's amazing to see this ancient martial art form being introduced on the One Belt, One Road and being practiced by modern Egyptians here in Cairo. Along with Tai Chi, Daily Mandarin classes have garnered immense interest from the people of Cairo, reducing cultural barriers between these two great civilizations. The man responsible for this is the cultural attaché of the Chinese embassy in Cairo, Mr. Yang Yang. He believes that the first step to bring Chinese companies here is to develop greater cultural understanding first. I think that all 到了埃及来,首先都要了解和学习埃及的这种风俗啊,文化呀,因为只有你了解了当地的风俗和这个文化,你才能同当地的居住民进行沟通,才能进行交流,才能进行合作。
都有放映一次这个中国的电影。然后呢，我们这里边还有这个，呃，每天一会儿你就会看到啊，这个中文的教学，中文教学呢。它不仅仅是包括这个语言的学习，也包括旅游知识，啊，包括这种好多中国传统文化的教学，呃，那么还有，呃，一会儿你也会看到还有武术教学啊，埃及人们很喜欢中国武术。My journey started in the Chinese city of Ningxia, where I saw how China is on a charm offensive to promote its Silk Road vision to countries in the Middle East. In Pakistan, where an economic corridor is reducing terrorist violence with a renewed focus on job development. In Iran, a crippled economy is now re-emerging on the world stage with the arrival of the Iron Silk Road. And here in Egypt, I've seen how international trade and cooperation can have a positive impact and bring political and social stability. As ties between countries along the One Belt, One Road strengthen, many people in this ancient land believe that integrated economies can help create a better connected and stable world. <laughs> 